Hello 3D printing friends. Today on the BB3D channel we are going to take a look at the Elegoo Super Starter Kit for Arduino Uno. Stick around and we'll get into it right after this. I'm Brian and you are watching BV3D. Hi, welcome back. Hey, if you're new here and you're wanting to learn about cool 3D printer upgrades, 3D modeling, and other 3D printing related stuff, Start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. You might have heard of Elegoo. They are the company making the Mars resin printer. You might not know that they also make a series of kits for people who want to get into tinkering around with electronics. And I've been wanting to do a small series about getting started with electronics and some intra-level coding to control the electronics projects that we would create. So when Elegoo wanted to send over their super starter kit for Arduino Uno, I took them up on the offer. Now to be clear, Elegoo generously sent this to me free of charge. Now because this is the first episode in the series, it's going to be a little longer than normal. I want to go over what comes in the kit, and after that, we've got some software that we need to download and install. Future episodes in the series will likely have us diving right into a project. So this is the kit, and it comes in this really nice little carrying case. Let's open it up and take a look inside. Wow, this little kit is jam-packed with stuff. I don't think they could have stuck anything else in here if they tried. All right, so right on top, there is a CD with instructions, sample code, and library files for use with the Arduino integrated development environment. The development environment, or IDE, is the app that we'll use to write code for the projects and upload that code to the Arduino Uno. There's also a thank you card. And there's the star of the show, the Arduino Uno R3 board. Let me take it out of the bag real quick. If you're not familiar with the Arduino, it's a little circuit board with a bunch of input and output connections built around a microcontroller, which is basically a little computer on a chip. There are a bunch of different sizes of them, from the Arduino Nano to the Arduino Mega, and dozens in between. Next, there is a little prototyping shield. I'll take that out of the bag too. This is a secondary circuit board that snaps onto the Arduino, covering it up like, well, like a shield. It gives you a portable way to prototype projects. These shields are a common way to add functionality to an embedded system built around an Arduino. In addition to ones like this, where you can add and remove components, there are some with dedicated electronics already on board to perform a specific task. There are a bunch of electronics components included as well, and these are all listed on this card uh, inside the lid of the box. Take some of them out and we can look at them. There are LEDs in different colors, short wires that you'll use to connect things together, a USB cable to connect the Uno to your computer so you can upload code, a DC motor and a soft fan blade that you can snap onto it, a small LCD screen, an infrared remote control, a small stepper motor, a joystick, some resistors, a 9 volt battery and a battery connector, an ultrasonic module, a bigger breadboard, a small servo, and even more stuff, but you get the idea. And for only about $35, this is a lot of stuff. Now, you may be wondering how this Arduino stuff ties in with a 3D printing channel on YouTube. Well, the thing that links the two together is the long history of the Arduino Mega Board as the brains in 3D printers. If you've ever heard someone talking about a ramps board in their 3D printer, well, they're talking about the printer's main board, and it's built around an Arduino Mega. The acronym RAMPS is RepRap, Arduino Mega, and Pololu Shield. RepRap is from Adrian Bowyer's concept of a machine that could replicate rapidly, in this case a 3D printer, which could be used to print most of the parts necessary to make another 3D printer. Arduino Mega is, of course, the Arduino Mega board, and the Pololu Shield had stepper motor drivers from Pololu Electronics on it. In addition to the electronics aspect of it, the skills that we'll learn writing code for the Arduino Uno will help you understand the Marlin firmware that in all likelihood is controlling your printer. So that's the tie-in. The Arduino Uno in this kit is just a slightly smaller version of the brain in probably millions of 3D printers. Oh, speaking of 3D printing, you might want to print this project tray or something like it. I made this to hold the Arduino Uno and the breadboard, and I added a little parts tray at the front so there's a handy place to keep the components that you might need for a project. You don't have to do this, but it does help keep things neat and tidy. 
It's 165 millimeters wide at its largest, so if it won't fit on your printer, that's okay. Just search Thingiverse for Arduino Uno breadboard, and there are a bunch of different ones. I just happen to like mine really well. Well, what do you say? Should we get started? I think we should get started. Now, pretty much every project that we're going to do is going to require that we use a computer. Why? Well, because nearly every project is going to have code associated with it, which controls the UNO and the electronic components that we will connect to it. And to write that code and send it to the UNO, we're going to need to use the Arduino IDE that I talked about a moment ago. So let's go download it. There's a link in the description that will take you to Elegoo's download page, where you can click to quickly get the Arduino IDE for your computer and operating system. Also on that page, scroll down a bit to find the Elegoo Uno R3 Super Starter Kit item and click it. That will download a zip file with the current versions of everything on the CD. Not only does it ensure that you have the most up-to-date stuff, it's also super handy if you've got a computer which doesn't have an optical drive. When you unzip it, you'll see folders for seven or eight different languages. Open the one for the language that you're most comfortable with. So what's next? Well, let's open up the Elegoo Super Starter Kit for Uno PDF. I recommend going through the packing list, which begins on page four. That's the big list of everything that's supposed to be in the kit. Make sure you have all the bits and pieces that you're supposed to. So do you have everything? Good. Okay, for ease of reference, instead of constantly saying Elegoo Super Starter Kit for Uno PDF, I'm just gonna refer to it as the guide. I thought about just using its initials and calling it the E-S-S-K-U-P or S-Cup, but that just didn't sound pleasant. So lesson zero in the guide covers installing the Arduino IDE. The Windows instructions are on pages nine through 17. I'm not really a Windows person, but if you are, please let the guide uh, be your guide. The Mac installation instructions are on pages 18 through 20, and the Cliff's Notes version of that is, download the zip file from Elegoo, unzip it, and drag the Arduino icon into the applications folder. So pause the video, get the Arduino IDE installed, and then we can continue. So with the Arduino IDE installed, we are finally ready to start doing something with this UNO board. Inside the guide, there are about 24 lessons. I pointed you to lesson zero already, which was installing the IDE. We are going to skip lesson one because it is essentially a reference guide. It covers how to install libraries for the Arduino. A library in this context is a code module that does the hard work of talking to a particular electronic component. For example, the library for the LCD screen that's included in the kit takes care of all the data transfer and timing and stuff like that, so you are free to concentrate on what you actually want to display on the screen. You are welcome to read that lesson, but for now, as I said, we're skipping it. We'll install libraries as we need them in future lessons, so when the time comes, we'll refer back to lesson one, but not now. Now, we are going to write code for the UNO. We are going to write and compile and run what is probably the most basic code you can write for the UNO that actually does something. And we're gonna do it without connecting any other electronic components. So what is this something that we're going to make the UNO do? We are going to make the Arduino UNO are you ready for this? We're going to make it blink its onboard LED. Let's cut over to the computer and get started with lesson two. Now, I'm walking you through the lesson using the guide as a guide, but if you want to refer back to it, it starts on page 31. Okay, launch the Arduino IDE. You may notice that it opens up a window and that window's name begins with the word sketch. Why sketch? Well, I guess the easy answer is why not? For reasons that I do not know, Arduino programs are called sketches. The term may stem from the concept of quickly sketching out an idea and sending it to the Arduino to test it out. You'll also notice that this sketch already has a little bit of code in it, and in all reality, it is valid code that you can compile and send to the Arduino, but it won't do anything. Let's change that. See the very first line of the sketch where it says void setup and then an open and close parentheses? Let's add a couple of carriage returns to push that line down a little bit and give ourselves room to add some code. Side note, look at the Arduino Uno. You see where those black connectors are with the rows of holes? Almost every single one of those corresponds to a pin on that long rectangular chip on the board. And every single one of those pins is assigned a number. The Uno's got an onboard LED. Well, it's got a few of them actually, but it's got one attached to pin 13. And that's the one that we're going to make blink. In order to easily refer to it, we're going to need to declare a variable in the code. Think of a variable as a labeled box that we can put data in. 
Declaring a variable is the process of telling the IDE what label we want on the box and what kind of stuff we're going to be putting in it. We have to be specific about things when we're writing code, so in addition to coming up with a name for the box, we have to tell the IDE exactly what kind of stuff we're going to put inside the box. For this project, we're going to name the box LED. And the kind of data that we're going to store are integer values. What is an integer? An integer is a whole number, like 0, or 37, or negative 92. It's okay if it's positive, or negative, or 0, but one thing it cannot be is fractional. That is, it can't contain only part of a number. 15 and a half? That and a half part means it's not an integer, it's not whole. When we're referring to pin numbers, we need whole numbers, integers. We don't have pin 13 and 3 quarters. So here's how we tell the IDE that we want a box named LED that will contain integers. We'll type int space LED space equals space 13 and then a semicolon. In that line, int means integer. That's the kind of things that we want to put in the box. LED is the label that we want on the box. The equals sign is what's called an assignment operator because it assigns values. 13 is the value that we're putting in the box. And that semicolon, well that weird little bit of punctuation is how we tell the IDE that this is the end of the line. So now we have a variable named LED which contains the integer value 13. Remember, pin 13 is the pin the LED is connected to on the Arduino. Now we need to do a little setup and that's what void setup is for. This is the stuff that happens one time as the Arduino is starting to run the code. A lot of the pins on the Arduino can handle input and output, but they can only handle one thing at a time. They can either be input or output, not both at the same time. So we need to be able to tell the Arduino that we want to use the LED pin as an output so we can turn it on or off. And the way we do that is by using the statement pin mode. So let's tab over so things line up nicely in this section and then type the word pin mode. But we're not done yet. Pin mode needs to know two things. Which pin are we setting the mode on, and what is that mode? So let's give it that information. Right after pin mode, and without any spaces, type an open parenthesis, and then type the variable name LED. Now type a comma, a space, and the word output in all caps. Close the parenthesis, and finish the line with a semicolon. Since this is a very simple program, that's all we need to do in the setup portion of the sketch. Let's turn our attention to the loop portion of the sketch. This is the part that happens immediately after the setup portion, and it happens over and over again until the heat death of the universe, or until the Arduino runs out of power, or until we compile a different sketch and run it. In order to turn the LED on or off, we need to write data to the LED pin. And the kind of data that we need to write is digital data, that is, a 1 or a 0, high or low, on or off. By contrast, analog data would include values in between on or off, for example, halfway on, like a dimmer switch and on your living room lights. And the Arduino can do that too, but only sort of and only on certain pins, and pin 13 is not one of those pins, so we're writing digital data. And here's how we do that. We'll type digital write, open parenthesis, LED, comma, space, high, in all caps, close parenthesis, semicolon. And that bit of code, when it runs, sends power through the LED pin, thus turning the LED on. Okay, great. Well, since we're in a loop, the LED will be turned on over and over again, forever and ever. But remember, we want to blink the LED. So how do we do that? Well, as those of us in IT will often reflexively ask, have you tried turning it off and on again? Yes, blinking an LED is more than turning it on. It's also turning it off. Can you guess how to do that? That's right, we're going to write a low signal to that pin, which stops sending power and turns the LED off. And we'll do that like this. Digital write, LED, low. There. Now, not only are we turning the LED on, we're also turning it off. But, do you know what would happen if we sent this sketch to the Arduino right now? It would turn the LED on and off as fast as it possibly could. And even though the Arduino is far from being the fastest computing device on the planet, it runs at probably 16 megahertz, whereas modern computers have clock speeds measured in the gigahertz range, it is still plenty fast enough to turn an LED off and on so fast you never really see it happening. It'll just look like it's on all the time, although it'll appear somewhat dim. 
So we need to slow it down a little and we'll do that by introducing a delay after each digital write. Delay takes a single value and that is the number of milliseconds that we want it to wait. A millisecond is one one thousandth of a second, so one thousand milliseconds is one second. So in the parentheses, let's type one thousand. And let's do this again after the second digital write. So now this loop will turn the LED on, it will wait for one second, it will turn the LED off, and it will wait for one second, and that's its life now. It just does that over and over. The net result is an LED that blinks slowly. Okay, it's almost time to send this to the UNO. And even though we've only typed six lines of code, it would be a bummer if something happened and we had to type them all over again. So let's save what we've done so far. Click the file menu and then click save. A dialog box appears giving us the opportunity to name this file something other than sketch. So I'm going to call mine lesson two blink. Unless told otherwise, the sketch will be saved in a folder named Arduino. On the Mac, this lives inside the Documents folder. On Windows, this lives, probably, inside the My Documents folder. So now that it's got a name and a place to go, click the Save button. Great! But if there's one thing I've learned about code, it's that code can be super picky about spaces and capitalization and punctuation and stuff like that. So. To make sure that what we've typed will at least pass some initial checks, let's check our work by clicking the check mark button. If it all checks out, great. If not, well, the IDE will highlight the line and down at the bottom of the window it will tell you what it doesn't like about that line. Fix whatever is wrong, it's probably something like a missing semicolon or something like that, and click the check button again. When it finally passes you'll know because there won't be any red highlights. So, now we're finally ready to install this blinking code on the UNO. Plug the UNO into the computer using the included USB cable. After about a second, it's powered up and running and, oh, it's blinking its LED. Now, this is actually completely expected because this super simple blink code is how they test the Arduino boards at the factory. But let's go ahead and send ours to the UNO anyway to make sure that we can do so. After that, we'll make changes to our code so we can prove to ourselves that what's running is our code and not the factory test code. So just to make sure that we're all at the same point, let's make sure that we've got the blink code in a sketch which passes its checks and the computer connected via USB to the UNO which is blinking. Let's make sure that the IDE knows which kind of Arduino board is connected. Click the tools menu, point to board, and click Arduino slash Genuino UNO. We also need to make sure the IDE knows which USB port the UNO is plugged into. So click the Tools menu again, point to Port, and click the port that has Arduino slash Genuino UNO in its name. If something seems wrong and you don't see a port with the right name, go back through Lesson 0 in the guide to make sure that everything is correct. You can pause here while you do that and the rest of us will be here waiting for you when you get back. Okay, now it's time to forge on ahead and get our code sent to the UNO. Yes, even though it's the same code that's already running on it, we need to make sure that we're able to talk to it. So, moment of truth. Click the Upload button. It's the button with the arrow on it, which is right next to the button with the check mark on it. After about a second, the code we wrote will be compiled and transmitted to the UNO, and the UNO will begin to run that code and it will do exactly what it was doing before, which is blinking its LED on for one second, off for one second. But now, it's time to make a change. Let's make it blink faster, shall we? How about twice as fast? We can do that by changing those delays. If we delay for 500 milliseconds instead of 1000, we're only waiting half as long between on-off cycles, and that will make the LED blink twice as fast. So let's go do that. Let's change 1000 to 500 in both of those delay statements. Now let's click the Upload button again. And now the LED is blinking twice as fast. Want it to go even faster? Change those 500s to 250s and upload it to the UNO. Want to make it look more like a strobe that flashes once per second? Change the first delay to 25 and the second delay to 975. That gives a very short on with a relatively long off before it cycles again. Try it. And you can get even more creative. What if you wanted it to blink out something in Morse code? By adding more digital write and delay statements, you can make the blink pattern change. 
go ahead and experiment and have some fun. I do think you'll get more out of the lessons by actually typing the code yourself, because you'll get used to how the language feels. Where does it like spaces? Where does it prefer punctuation? That sort of thing. But if typing isn't your thing, that's okay too, and if you look inside the folder where we found the guide, you'll also see folders named Code and Libraries. If you ever want to skip typing the code for a lesson, you can find it and open it from that code folder. And when the time comes to install Libraries, we may need to dig into that Libraries folder. And even I may take the shortcut of opening the code file for a lesson if I think typing it all in is going to make an episode run long. Speaking of long episodes, I know this has become one, but it kind of needed to. There was a lot of one-time setup stuff that we needed to do with software downloads and installing the Arduino IDE and stuff like that. Going forward, the episodes will closely mirror the lessons in the guide, each one of which is designed to show how to use a particular component that came in the kit. Some will need more code than others, but that's okay. And if you want to skip ahead and work on other lessons before I do them, go for it. Now, I really hope this series will inspire you to dig deeper into electronics and coding. I find both enjoyable, and I've been doing both for years. <sighs> well, now it's time to wrap this up. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video, and thank you for all the likes, comments, and shares. Now, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss out on any cool 3D printing stuff. And if you like this episode, please give it a thumbs up, and if not, give it a thumbs down. But either way, please share your thoughts in the comments. If you like the content I'm producing and you want to help out, check the description for ways that you can do that. Shopping using the Amazon affiliate link really helps no matter what you're buying, and heck, even just subscribing is a great way to support the channel and help keep me making these videos for you. Well, now that I've got the Arduino IDE installed and a blinking Uno, I'm going to see what else I can make it do. You do the same, and I'll see you next time.